Well, well, Craig has asked us to talk about the achievements, the uh, goals of our respective communities, but I want to step back and just make a personal comment about the DCO. Um, I was a graduate student in the 1960s, <laughs> long time ago, and I was the beneficiary of a vanguard of scientists who took a very aggressive interdisciplinary approach to science. Um, people like Carl Woese, who's a physicist turned microbiologist, and um, Leslie Orgel, a nucleic acid chemist at Scripps, and Jim Ferris, who was an origins of life chemist, um, and Sherwood Chang, a physicist. And these guys taught each other how to speak their respective languages. And they were a vanguard of people who made up a core of something called exobiology, which of course is the precursor to astrobiology. And their goal was to use strong, aggressive, interdisciplinary science to try and understand the origins of life. And so now we fast forward to uh, 2000, yeah, 2019. I have to think about what year we're in. And, and so 50 years later, we still don't know the origin or if there were origins of life. But instead, we have the DCO. <laughs> and, and the DCO is, for me, the most spectacular interdisciplinary science program ever, even better than what exobiology was. And so I look forward to great achievements 50 years from now, uh, maybe as a passing uh, goal. Maybe they all understand the origins of life. And that certainly would be fun. So, so let me talk now about deep life. And I share this with Kai. Yuli Hendricks, and originally it started out with Isabel Danielle, who is the only person who's chaired multiple of these DCO communities. Um, see if this works. Um, in, I think it was 1998, a fellow named Barney Whitman sort of put our understanding of biological diversity on its head. This is not his slide, but what Barney did is he was a microbiologist who made the argument that um, he integrated numbers of microbial cells in the planet, arguing there were about 10 to the 30th, and that they accounted for someplace between 50 and 90% of the total carbon content on the planet. Well, this is a more contemporary view of that. Uh, I will simply point out that, that Barney's ideas have been uh, supplanted by this view, um, in which I think that bacteria and viruses and fungi and protists, these are all essentially microbes, account for about 15 to 18% of the carbon on the planet. And of course, this is from the perspective of a plant biologist um, who, who drew that slide. Um, what is clear, though, is that microbes really do dominate the subsurface. And if you look at the distribution of microbes in the subsurface um, relative to marine and and terrestrial environments, you hardly see any microbes relative, you know, in the animal, you know, the fraction of the biomass that fall outside of the subsurface. So you see some microbes in marine settings, although I think, once again, these are underestimates. So microbes are important, and that's why they're part of the Deep Carbon Observatory. They're mostly found beneath the surface. So these are the decadal goals of the deep life community. Um, the first was to try and define the diversity and, and to draw a map of how they're distributed on the planet and how it relates to the carbon cycle. Of course, we want to know at the same time what their environmental limits are to, to life. How do they accomplish living in these extreme environments? And then, of course, we want to understand the interactions between deep life and carbon cycling on Earth. So those are the fundamental decadal goals. And of course, like all the communities, we have a whole long set of sub-questions that you just don't want to have to listen through right now. Um, these are, I decided that I would talk not about details of individual projects, but just an overview of the accomplishments of, of deep life. And it's, we think there are many ways to measure success, and so I've listed a few here. Um, the community started out with just maybe 20 or 30 scientists who met in Bremen to talk about where we would move deep life. And today it's grown to about 400 participants. Um, there have been a total of about 420 peer-reviewed papers from the deep life community over the last decade. I was surprised when we put together our report for this year, we realized that 95 of these papers were published in the last 18 months. So you can see that deep life has really crescendoed to the point of having a lot to boast about in its final year. 
And I think importantly, um, this was one of its major sociological achievements. There's a new international center for deep life that Fen Peng Wang um, established at the SJTU in, in, um, in Shanghai. And this is just a slide that, that shows many people in the deep life community as well as our Chinese collaborators. Um, other accomplishments, there are other things that were achieved. We, we're able to fund 19 different pilot projects that range from 15 to $25,000. If you were a graduate student, you could apply for and receive funding for these pilot projects. There was a half dozen major field campaigns. So trying to ex access samples for deep life can be really incredibly expensive. And these are just examples of, of what you need for deep subsea floor ocean drilling types of operations. Um, this ship is especially interesting. This is the Chico. Those on the executive committee had the opportunity to visit this ship. It, this thing is amazing. It can sit in four kilometer deep water, sink a hole another three or four kilometers beneath the subsea floor. And it can do it standing on station in a hurricane. <laughs> How you do that, um, it takes the Japanese uh, excellence and technology to make that happen. Um, these are some of the major field site initiatives. I'm not going to talk about them because they will be discussed in some length at this meeting. So I believe that uh, Gretchen Frill Green is going to talk on Friday about the Atlantis Massif. And Susan Lang is going to talk about both Lost City and Atlantis Massif. And these, of course, are very interesting um, from the standpoint of deep life and, and serpentinization reactions that occur there. There is also, of course, the Oman drilling project that Matt Schrank led the deep life interest. And Peter Kelman is going to talk about that also on Friday at 11. I don't know if Peter's going to talk about biology or not. That would be out of character for him to do that. But, <laughs> but, but there's a lot of interesting science from the microbiological perspective. Uh, there's another project that we won't get to hear about, although Alex, you, you may have a poster, I'm not sure. Um, about the Crystal Geyser in Alum Rock Springs. And what this is, this is a, a CO2 geyser system that brings up water from deep beneath the subsurface, or deep in the subsurface. And you don't have to worry about contamination because it's just carrying the samples up to the surface. And then finally, we've already heard quite a bit about biology meets subduction. And, I believe, and we've heard a little bit from Peter Berry this morning. And I, didn't have the opportunity to attend Karen's talk last night because we were drinking wine and forgot to go. Um, <laughs> now we've heard Karen's talk before. You can see it on YouTube anyways. Um, <laughs> in any event, um, Donato is going to bring us back up to date on what's happened with that project. Um, it's an, I, I like to point out, and, and we keep on coming back to this meeting about Biology meets subduction is really a, a, a poster child for interdisciplinary science in the DCO. And I think that you, you have already seen a flavor. I'm not going to, because of time, to talk about what this slide means. But I do want to talk about what this slide means. And I don't want you to take home this information that's on the slide. But the point is, it's so interdisciplinary. And you can see this long list of the kinds of analyses that go into doing the biology meets subduction types of um, experiments that are being done. And then um, the, the big elephant in the room, if you will, um, the, the most expensive project that was underway was this IODP expedition called the T-Limit Expedition. T-Limit Expedition has not yet been published, although I think it's being submitted in the very near future to science. Um, and Fubio Itagaki is going to talk about this at 11 o'clock again on Friday. And Kai, my colleague Kai Henricks and Fumio were the co-drivers of this program. And this program involved being able to take advantage of the technology of the Chiku and, and sinking um, holes. Excuse me, I should go back, but I'll bet I can't. Anyways, they, they were going to do drills into the Nantai uh, trough and it's a fairly steep temperature gradient that occurs. And the idea is you go further and further down what happens to biology, what happens to the microbes. And so this is just one of many slides or many figures that you can get out of it. And you can see as you go down deeper and deeper in depth, the, the number of microbes, which is represented in terms of cell numbers in the abscissa, drops. 
um, you get down to a point where you have this minimal cell abundance down at about 900 and you find, and, and then we have temperature plotted here, and, and you still find microbes at temperatures that are as high as 119 or 18 degrees. Um, it's this region that actually is very intriguing to me, and it's intriguing to me because the numbers of cells in a gram of sediment ranges from one to 10. So that, that has two comments about that. One is the exquisite sensitivity and, and, and ability of, of scientists on the Chico um, to be able to detect such low cell numbers. And secondly, microbiologists today understand, they understand full well that microbes evolved to a large extent through processes that involve moving DNA between different microbes, so horizontal gene transfer. So you, if you think about one microbe <laughs> in a gram of sediment, that's kind of like having 100,000 people on the planet Earth, having them universally, uniformly distributed on the entire surface, there wouldn't be any sex. <laughs> so there wouldn't, be, there wouldn't be any exchange of DNA. So how microbes do this in this kind of environment is really quite a mystery to me. And then finally, the, the most current expedition that's underway, and uh, just, uh, this is being run by Andreas Tesk and Daniel Lazard, and it's happening now as we speak, and it's the Guaymas Basin expedition. And this is an interesting system where you have these hydrothermally uh, heated sediments, and the idea is to look at several of these uh, drill, drill locations and to determine what is happening in terms of the chemistry, the microbiology, et cetera. Okay, the, the other project that's gotten a lot of attention that really is what, I was gonna use a bad word, what, what drew me into the uh, DCO originally was the census of deep life. And Jesse Osobel had asked me to come in and help to organize the census of deep life because of our success with the International Census of Marine Microbes. And this project is now being led by, by uh, Rick Caldwell and he'll speak at Thursday afternoon, this afternoon at 1.30 about this project. And when it started, um, we had access suddenly to new sequencing technology, something called 454 technology. And we, it was still pretty expensive to work. We had 16 projects completed in 2014, and each of these projects could submit up to eight samples for analysis. Well, today the picture is improved. We've now completed 135 of these projects. Each of these projects would have as many as 20 or 30 samples. We're, not, we're using DNA as a proxy for the occurrence of microorganisms in a sample, and I won't go into the details about how that was done, but to suffice it to say, it's, it's really dramatically expanded our understanding about diversity and distribution of microbes in the subsurface. So just a, a few tidbits that I think that Rick is going to talk about in much greater detail. If you look at the amount of diversity, and that's what ASV refer to, you see that archaea are much more diverse in marine environments than they are in terrestrial environments. And that probably has everything to do with the fact that they are so prominent in terms of the subsea floor. And then secondly, if you now look at bacteria, you don't really see a significant difference in the diversity of bacteria between marine and terrestrial samples. And so we can speculate a lot about that. Perhaps that has something to do with communication between those environments as a function of bacterial adaptation. Um, it's very easy if you want to ordinate the data, that what these communities look like. It's very easy to resolve marine from, from terrestrial environments. It's not so easy to do that when it comes to bacteria. And perhaps most importantly, if you start to look at diversity, Deep life is very, very diverse. And so these just represent sites that have been collected from different projects. And, oh, I did it. Can you go back one? Thank you. Um, and what you can see is, is that the amount of diversity in every one of these samples is very, very high. So th these are well-documented different microbial taxa based on nucleic acid sequence analysis. So there have been many discoveries by deep life. Just a few that I'll, I'll summarize in this next few slides. Um, I already told you that Bonnie Rittman said that there were 10 to the 30th cells. That turns out to be an artifact of the way he looked at microbial diversity because most of his samples came from continental shelf regions. 
if you now look broadly and you look in things like the Pacific Gyre, you, you end up finding, and this is a paper uh, published by, uh, uh, by Kellemeyer in, early in the DCO, and you see that really microbial abundance is about an order of magnitude difference down around 10 to the 29th total cells in the subsurface. And more recently, uh, Kara Mendegat-Bosco has published a paper showing similar amounts of bacteria that occur in the terrestrial environments. So once again, large numbers of cells. Um, these cells are not just sitting there dead doing nothing. They're actually alive. They're actually act active. And so this is just work that was done by Yuki Morono showing uh, through SIPS analysis that they are incorporating carbon or incorporating nitrogen. So there's biology occurring in the deep subsurface. And then um, other discoveries. The turnover time of microbial communities. It's just astounding. It can be, by turnover time, how, generation times, it can be as long as 73,000 years. That's the longest number I know about. It's a long time. It's, it's, um, th things that we always took for granted that the subsurface or the sediments would be more or less anaerobic environments. That turns out to not be true. You find a lot of aerobic organisms. It's work that Steve Dunt has done. A microbial life can be found 2.4 kilometers at least beneath the seafloor. And if you look at mechanisms, you start thinking about mechanisms, well, osmolites and hydrostatic pressure combine to have conformational impacts. And so we've supported this extreme biophysics initiative that's being led by Roland Winter and, and Kathy Royer. And, and it's allowed for coming up with intersections between people who have isolated and who are studying deep subsurface microbes um, with people who work on mechanisms. And then um, we've also found Virginia Edgecombe group has found fungi going down to two and a half kilometers. These fungi, of course, are eukaryotes. They're not archaea or bacteria. And as far as mechanisms that I don't really understand, but um, I haven't gone carefully through Alex Prost's paper with Jill Banfield, but the point is that they've come up with evidence that homologous recombination and transposons shape through horizontal gene transfer uh, deep subsea floor microbial populations. And, and these studies tend to focus mostly on mineral organisms with minimal metabolism. So what are the unsolved questions? <coughs> so the evolutionary models for life in the deep subsurface um, might preclude, that is the density might preclude horizontal gene transfer, and yet it seems that it's going on. How does that work despite the low densities? We don't have good estimates. We still don't have good estimates about the distribution of microbes. We just haven't sampled enough. We don't know. Um, the, the estimates are based on modeling. I think we need more data. And we, are we really close to a global map? Only in the, in the most sparse way possible, I think. And then the biggest mystery for me is what is the mobility of microbes within the subsurface? How do they move around? How do they get there? How can you find similar communities in two deep subsea floor or deep subterrestrial surface environments? Those are big questions to address. Um, other measures of success, the amount of funding so within the last, once again, sometimes producing progress reports for a year is beneficial. We identified $75 million in new funding over the last 18 months. That's quite a bit. Um, and then there are a bunch of projects that I've just listed examples of, but in the interest of time, because I'm between you and lunch and I don't want to stay here, um, there are at least 20 other projects beyond those that I've listed here. And. Um, how did the DLC achieve the success? So we've all been talking about the nurturing of young scientists. The DLC um, has provided resources to everyone, especially young scientists, um, using a format that obtained community input for deciding what was important. So community building was a big part of our effort. Joint community expeditions, including uh, things like biology meets subduction, um, partnerships with the Center for Deep Energy Investigations. There was a certain amount of overlap between the investigators in this large science technology center that Jan Amund ran. 
and DCO scientists, and so that was beneficial. And of course, nurturing of early career scientists. Early career scientists, as I've already mentioned, could submit proposals that were funded by the DLC and led to publications, and in some cases, to new funding opportunities. And that was done through pilot f project funding, quick decisions about proposals. And then there is the enthusiasm expressed in commitment by members of the steering committee. So there are a dozen people, and I haven't outlined their names, but they are I'm very much grateful for their participation. As I am um, happy about the different scientists who <laughs> participate in, in deep life, and they, they come from all over the world. They, they come from China and Japan and India and, and South America and North America and throughout Europe. So thank you.